Welcome to a very special live episode of Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Friday, March 22nd. I'm your host, Tom Moore. The Akron game in 163 days. The game against Michigan in 253 days. We get some news on Thursday afternoon. A true freshman at Ohio State made some program history. And honestly, the most surprising part of this might be how not particularly surprising it is that this has happened and this has happened when it has happened. I'm joined by Kevin Noon of BuckeyeHuddle.com. Kevin, how not surprised were you to learn that Jeremiah Smith, five-star wide receiver, true freshman wide receiver at Ohio State now, was not only the first Buckeye to lose his black stripe this year, but also the fastest Buckeye in program history to lose his black stripe. I'm more surprised that they even bothered to give him one, if we're being semi-honest. I mean, I know you're going to get one. Caleb Downs has a black stripe, for God's sake. So. It's not something that you can escape. It's not something you can negotiate. I'm going to come in, but you can't give me a black stripe because I'm not dealing with that. No, they all get him, and he's lost it, and I'm not surprised whatsoever. I mean, he is just different. We, you know, I have seen it through a couple of years watching him in high school at Shamada Madonna. Uh, you know, he gets to Ohio State. He's still the same guy, and all of his teammates absolutely rave about him. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that as the show goes on. But uh, no surprise, no surprise whatsoever, no surprise that he is the record setter in terms of how quickly he's been able to shed his black stripe. But then again, I will say this. There is not a case of there's not a laundry list that the coaches have. It's like you have to be able to catch 50 passes and do 20 pull-ups and be able to recite the Greek alphabet before this match goes out or anything like that. There's no criteria. It is all kind of a subjective thing, but here we are. This is around the time I would have expected it unless they wanted to keep a stripe on him for motivation. And I don't think this kid needs any extra motivation. He's one of the most driven individuals I've ever seen. Yeah, motivation, definitely not a real issue with Jeremiah Smith. And we'll get into what Brian Hartline had to say about him earlier on Thursday. Got a chance to talk to Brian Hartline, got a chance to talk to several other wide receivers. And uh, is, so we've got plenty to talk about on that front. Just to give you some some context here, this is after four practices. Tony Gerderman reported on BuckeyeHuddle.com. This is the fastest any true freshman has ever lost his black stripe after just four practices Carnell Tate, the previous record holder, lost his black stripe after five practices last year. Uh, and in terms of the date, Stephen Means of Cleveland.com went back and did the uh, did the digging, found that Justin Fields was the earliest person to lose his black stripe. That was on March 25th, 2019. Carnell Tate matched that last year, March 25th, 2023. Jeremiah Smith, earlier than either of them, March 21st, earlier than either of them in terms of practice number, practice number four. Uh, the, you know, this is someone who has for years and years and years been getting gassed up by every single person in the industry who sees him. I saw Bud Elliott, I think, who was uh, one of the national 247 guys, uh, quote tweeted the Ohio State uh, tweet about the black stripe and just said, yeah, that tracks. This guy's been an NFL wide receiver playing high school ball for multiple years. So, you know, not a big surprise. So this is, you know, the national guys are saying the same thing as well. And Brian, here's what Brian Hartline had to say. He was asked about Jeremiah Smith. Just going to read this whole quote. Quote, I love the way he lives. I love the way he approaches things. I love the questions he asks. I love the way he makes mistakes and then corrects mistakes. It's very veteran-like, and there's so much ball he has to learn. He literally does things that are good, and I'm like, you know why that worked? And he says, Coach, I have no freaking idea. So I'm trying to teach him all of that, why it worked, and then the consistency uh, with which it works. And then it just goes through the roof. I'm very excited and proud of the conversations that we're currently having, and I'm excited for them to keep going so, Kevin, that's just the mental side of the game. That's the off-field approach side of the game. That's the kind of stuff I hear all of that, and then I go, I feel like we heard a lot of this same stuff uh, about a guy named Marvin about three years ago. But the thing is, is that we heard a lot of things about Marvin, but then we didn't see him until we saw him. And let's not forget, too, that Marvin said a lot of these things about Carnell Tate. And a lot of people want to lump Carnell Tate and Brandon Ennis together, but Carnell Tate enrolls early because IMG allowed that. Brandon Ennis did not enroll early. So Brandon Ennis is kind of a year behind him in terms of the whole system and everything else. But 
yeah, we heard a lot of positive things about Marv, but we hear a lot of positive things through the years. We don't necessarily see all of it. We can put in the high school tape, and let's remember, in high school, there is so much variation from school to school and everything else and who you're competing against, and you have to take so many other parts of the equation and put it into the blender to kind of figure out what the hell is going on with uh, with Jeremiah playing in South Florida, playing for South Florida Express 7-on-17, seven seven playing against the best competition out there. I know everybody who's involved with that program. They're all great people. I give them a ton of grief because I can, because we're very, you know, we're very close. But Jeremiah has been able to do all of these things. So I kind of take some of this stuff even above what it was we heard with the hype around Marvin. Because honestly, when you look at Marv's class, yeah, there was a lot of great conversation, but was there the one guy everybody was talking about and being like, oh my God, this guy is just far and away, you know, blowing everybody away and everything else. And it, it's funny because here in Jeremiah's class, there's another receiver named Mylon Graham, who we will get to see soon. And he's pretty damn special on his own. But uh, this is a time where I say, believe the talk, believe the hype. He is going to be a day one starter in my opinion. I mean, and that's saying a lot when you are returning a Mecca Buka and you have Carnell Tate and Brandon Ennis and some of these other guys on the roster, you better get the most out of, out of Jeremiah Smith over the course of three years, because there is a 0% chance you will have him for year four. Yeah. That, that feels like barring something really, really surprising happened happening. You feel like you kind of just sort of pencil him as a, in, as a first round draft choice in what would that be? 27, I guess, 2027. So yeah, it, it feels like that's sort of where this is trending. And, you know, I think Tony Gerdeman and I have really tried to not get too far ahead on anything. Cause this is again, someone who has not caught any passes that counted for anything at Ohio State so far and who has not, you know, not played in front of any kind of a crowd yet at Ohio State or any of that kind of stuff. And I think we're just based on history, the track record tends to be the true freshman wide receivers, even the ones who go on to do great things and be first round draft picks. Marvin Harrison barely played the first half of the season had a catch or two like at Indiana or, you know, which was kind of like late October, you really didn't see Marvin Harrison until the Rose Bowl when some of the other guys had opted out. Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson had opted out. And then it was like, okay, and now Marvin Wilson, Marvin Harrison's here and he has three touchdowns. Okay. Turns out he's probably going to be good. Chris Olave, you really didn't see him until late October, early November, had a couple touchdowns against Michigan in the first half. It was like, okay, this guy's probably going to be pretty good. Greg, uh, Garrett Wilson, same thing. You saw him kind of show up in mid-season, late season 2019, had that like really notable catch where he went way up against Clemson in the first drive of the Fiesta Bowl that year. It was like, okay, this guy's going to be pretty good. Typically, I don't think you're going to see someone until, I, I sort of assume you're not going to see like first quarter, lots of lots of snaps, maybe even a start for a true freshman wide receiver in the first half of the season. That has sort of been my position just year after year after year. Listen, don't get out over your skis on any of this stuff. But, Kevin, I don't want to get out over my skis too far, but it feels like if you are going to see someone playing meaningful snaps in game one, game two, starting or not, if he's out there in the first quarter of these games, that tells me an awful lot. And it feels like Pretty much everything we're seeing, everything we're hearing right now is sort of trending in that direction. Yeah, and trust me, I get a little bit of an un uneasy feeling in my stomach saying, you know, passing on all these platitudes, saying all these positive things because can he block? Can he do all this other stuff? That's all going to be part of the equation too, but it's a lot easier for a J.K. Dobbins as a true freshman to trot out there and play because for a running back, so much of it is, you see the daylight, run toward the daylight, go. Uh, for a receiver, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more in terms of, you know, being able to run all the routes and everything else and handle your blocking responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This isn't going to be a case of like where 
Ohio State, and I'm going a little bit back in the way back machine. Jerron Carter, okay, you have one route. You're running a nine. You are running straight ahead, and we're going to try and get it to you. And unfortunately for Jerron, Ohio State didn't have a lot of quarterbacks that necessarily were as accurate as a CJ Stroud or somebody like that. But uh, when it comes when it comes to Jeremiah, my expectation is absolutely, and and it only helps that Ohio State is not opening the season at Notre Dame. It's not having that type of game right out of the gate. Now, yes, I have I have long maintained Jeremiah Smith is a day one starter. If he doesn't, if he's not out there in the first series, well, then technically I guess I'm wrong. He wasn't a day one starter, but he is going to see meaningful playing time. And I honestly do believe that he is going to be a starter in that game. But there is a long ways to go here from March 21st when we are doing this show to the Akron game, a hundred and however many days, as you said at the top of the show here on uh, on on, uh, on Buckeyes tomorrow morning. But uh, yeah, I don't have any reason to doubt it. One hundred and sixty-three days till the Akron game for those. And I see we have a couple of people joining us late. Jeremiah Smith, the fastest Buckeye to lose his black stripe in program history, lost it after four practices, March twenty-first. That is earlier than the previous record holder, which was Carnell Tate last year after five practices and March 25th for a true freshman. And uh, Justin Fields lost his on March 25th as well. And, you know, in addition to Brian Hartline, who I read, read you the whole quote earlier in the show, uh, Brandon Innes, we talked to Brandon Innes uh, earlier in the day on Thursday, Brandon Innes basically said, yeah, you got to get him out there. Like you, you got to, you got to play him. Like this is not, you know, this is, this is not like, well, you know, maybe he'll have some kind of role at some point. Like, no, you, you got to get him out there. This is just everything is pointing in this direction. And I think Jeremiah Smith is, you know, the, the new and shiny guy. And, you know, there's obviously a lot to be excited about. But Carnell Tate's out there, too. Carnell Tate is someone who I think has gotten a little bit lost, which is crazy because he was the guy who last year Marvin Harrison came out and just flat out said, yeah, he's ahead of where I was at this point in my career. He had previously set the record for the fastest uh, a guy had lost his black stripe after his fifth practice. And he is someone who I think is probably, Kevin, even more likely to be a starter this year or as likely to be a starter this year. You know, there are three of the top four spots open after Marvin Harrison and Julian Fleming and and Xavier uh, Johnson all left after last season. So Three of those top four spots are open. Two of the starting spots are open. You're kind of writing Emeka Ibuka in Ibuka's name in there in ink as well. But man, I know they, you know, this is not going to be the first time Ohio State has a really talented wide receiver room, but to get Emeka Ibuka back, to have a second year like Carnell Tate, to have a guy like Jeremiah Smith already making the kind of impressions that he has, you know. I, I don't know if this is, it's probably too early to have the, is this potentially the best wide receiver unit Ohio State has had? But I mean, it's, you know, we might be having that conversation at some point this year. Well, and the thing too is that Ohio State doesn't run 10, doesn't run one back no tight. So you talk about a top four, but you're not going to have four out there. But I will say this, with Ohio State bringing in Chip Kelly, bringing in a dedicated offensive coordinator who could maybe make sure that they are running more than three deep at wide receiver, because how do you not play the top four? And we haven't even talked about Jaden Ballard, or we haven't talked about Kojo Antwi or Keon Grays or Bryson Rogers or Mylon Graham. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And we all have seen the picture where you have Olave and Wilson and Ibuka and Harrison. It's like, oh my God, how did Ohio State not win like 11 million natties at that point? Well, defense, but uh, you know, over over and above that. I mean, it is just such a deep room. It is it is kind of ridiculous at that point, and it's going to be important for Ohio State, I think, to play more. We see Noah Rogers transfer out after a year. Uh, I don't think necessarily, I think that was more of homesickness than lack of play. But then again, if Noah Rogers catches 40 passes last year, is that different? I don't know. I mean, do you buy in more if you're included more? I think there's something to that in terms of human nature, but let's not talk about the ones who got away. Let's talk about the ones that they have. And they have just such a tremendous room. And we had the opportunity yesterday to watch Will Howard. We had the opportunity yesterday to watch Devin Brown throw for real 
We have seen them play routes on air. We've seen them do just some drill work. And the two practices that we've been allowed to see, we will see a, another practice at the end of the month with the student appreciation practice. By then, they're in pads. We're going to get to hopefully see a little bit more. But uh, in terms of where Ohio State's receiver room is and where this passing game should be, I mean, it's it it, it it's it's silly. I mean, it's it's silly, and I would like to be able to be more, you know, wilder about the terms I'm using there. But I mean, silly is the one that makes sense. I mean, it it almost seems unfair. As long as Ohio State's able to get the other aspects of its offense up, I mean, this is going to be kind of crazy. Yeah, a couple quick house, housekeeping notes before we move on to kind of the next thing I wanted to talk to you about, which was the quarterbacks. Uh, if you are watching this live, hit that thumbs up button. That help, will help other folks find this show uh, now and later as a recorded broadcast. Uh, a couple folks in the comments asking about the Black Stripe draft that Tony Gerdeman and I did on our 1000th episode of Buckeye Weekly. Uh, I always win the Black Stripe draft. Every single year I win the Black Stripe draft. So yes, of course, I had Jeremiah Smith. I got the first pick this year. Tony gave me the first pick. And I said, well, this is the easiest one I think I've ever had. And it turns out, yep. So Jeremiah Smith, not a big surprise. Uh, Tony, people are asking about where they can track the Black Stripes. Uh, we do that on our huddle on the huddle board at BuckeyeHuddle.com. If you want to become a member there, that's something Tony has been very good about tracking over the years. So he has all that information for you. So if you want to find that, you can find that all there on the huddle board presented by Jeff Ruby Steakhouse at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Uh, real quickly, before we get on to the quarterbacks, I did want to mention you talked about Noah Rogers transferring out. There was another Watt Rogers who plays wide receiver for Ohio State who also entered the transfer portal, but then he came back. Uh, Bryson Rogers, maybe we need to call him Boomerang. Boomerang Rogers no came relation. back. No relation. Uh, he left. Uh, he left Ohio State to go into the portal, and then came back in the portal. We get a chance to talk to him on Thursday as well, just a little bit. And he, you know, he didn't go into a ton of specifics on it, but it sure sounded a lot like he probably felt like he was, you know, a little bit buried. And that was, you know, that's a loaded wide receiver room last year. You know, you have a talent, you know, really talented guys coming in again this year. I think it would be relatively easy to feel like, hey, maybe I'm not going to be able to see the field real early here. But he's someone who last, you know, towards the end of last year, we had people telling us that, you know, some of the stats that they keep in terms of, you know, yards per target and that kind of stuff during practices, he was right at the top of those lists. They talked about uh, earlier today about the fact that he is, you know, maybe the shiftiest, the uh, fastest guy uh, in terms of change of direction and that kind of stuff on the team in terms of wide receiver. So Bryson Rogers, another one to keep an eye on, another young wide receiver. It is very easy to just start naming a few guys and it's like, okay, you get you get through three, four, and there's still plenty of very exciting uh, wide receivers on that team beyond that group. So I wanted to just kind of touch on Bryson Rogers real quick. You mentioned, Kevin, something you, I was not at Pro Day on Wednesday. You were, and normally Pro Day is really all about the guys who are have already left and are headed to the NFL. But they need, you know, the Cade Stover and Sam Wigloose and Xavier Johnson. Well, they needed someone to throw them the football. So, you know, you sort of indirectly got a chance to get a firsthand look at Devin Brown and Will Howard, both throwing the football, kind of running through the full route tree. What was your sense of how both of those guys threw? And, you know, yes, it's just against air. So, sure, it's easy to look. It's, you know, it, it's a lot harder when there's a defense out there trying to stop you. But just from, you know, from the limited view that you got on Wednesday, what was your sense for Will Howard and Devin Brown? The quarterback derby is over. We know who the winner is going to be based on throwing it against air. Not so much. No, I've had a lot of people come to me and said, I believe Will Howard won. I believe Devin Brown won. And that, well, they're not saying necessarily the whole quarterback battle, but they are saying from what they've seen, we have four minutes and 21 seconds, I think, or is 412? I don't know. I get numbers flipped sometimes of the throws. Rapid fire. It starts with Devin Brown, then it goes to Will Howard. Be sure to check it out here on this channel, youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle for, for that footage. Both of them threw a very nice ball. I think in terms of that day in particular, I think Will was a little sharper. Now that doesn't mean that Devin Brown should be packing his stuff and get ready to move. That's one day, one day, 40 throws, whatever it may have been. And we don't have all 80 of them. I wasn't, I'm not that great of a photographer, but we had a lot of them. And um, I think, I think, I think they both showed a lot. We we saw 
we saw some swing passes. We we saw some stuff over the middle. We saw some some deep balls. I mean, we you know we didn't see the full progression. They were not quarterbacks showing off their stuff for the NFL because they were draft eligible and ready to go. We did not see the full route tree. We didn't see any of that stuff. This is very different than we saw CJ Stroud last year go through all of this. So don't go in there and expect to see every pass, but go ahead and watch it, please. Uh, and hit, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel, thumbs up, all that good stuff. But uh, yeah, I think it was very good to see this because we hadn't seen anything longer than a 10 yard pass really in terms of practice. So we know they're both capable of throwing a deep ball. We don't know what would happen if a defensive back was out there, but it was a good, it was a good teaser. It was a good teaser, if you will. And with us being three plus weeks away from the spring game, whatever that may be, I think it's enough to wet everybody's whistle until we get to the spring game, but don't expect to go in there and make a decision coming out of the spring game either, <laughs> because that's just not, how this is going to roll. We're going to go into the summer, probably not knowing everybody's going to have a favorite, but we'll just go from there. All right. Yeah. The spring game I mentioned earlier, Justin Fields being the earliest person to lose his black stripe at one point, the 2019 spring game. And I think he was like four for 13 in that spring game and had like a 99 yard touchdown pass. Uh, and that was kind of it. So yeah, the spring like game is a, 25 yards or something. It yeah, was like 89 were on one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was that was kind of a rough spring game. We'll see what this year's spring game looks like. But yeah, there's not no shortage of people for them to throw to. Uh, a couple more things I wanted to hit in the comments. Uh, someone asked, uh, Wingman Ted asked, did anyone else lose a black stripe? Uh, walk on wide receiver Brennan Schram out of Medina. He also lost his black stripe. He is a second year player walk on wide receiver. So he, uh, he was the other guy to lose his black stripe. That one. Yeah. That, that. They, they tweeted that out, you know, an hour later or something like that. So yeah, that, uh, that did come out as well. Uh, people wondering, you know, Caleb Downs, the next one to lose the black stripe. I think that, you know, if I was, if I was a betting man, I would think Caleb Downs is probably going to be the next one to lose his black stripe. I mean, and that's for Alabama. He may transfer you know, back to Alabama if he doesn't lose the black stripe. You, you have more than seven Twitter followers. You're not allowed to put that rumor out there. No, no, no. Yes, there, lots of lots of people were getting all worked up over that earlier in the week. And it's like, well, he keeps showing up to practice at Ohio State and like posing for pictures with recruits and stuff like that. So he appears to still be there. Pretty sure that's not, you know, one of those AIA images. Uh, we saw him there at practice working after practice today. So, uh, you know, as of uh, what, 1130 a.m. or so on Thursday, Caleb Downs, Still apparently a member of the Ohio State football program and seemingly likely to stay that way. Uh, Kevin, any other big takeaways from uh, our time at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center on Thursday? Or are we good to wrap up? No, I mean, I really I can't say that I really had any takeaways. I mean, Brian Hartline did talk about the fact that practice can get a little chippy between the receivers and the DBs. We talk about iron sharpening iron. You have a return of BIA. You have zone six to see these two units go again. Well, we don't get to see it, but to know that they're going against each other is only going to make both better as the year goes on. Uh, none of that's going to matter if the quarterback can't deliver the ball, whether it be from their own abilities or the line in front of them. But I, th I think there's a lot of reason to be excited about what is in store for, for both units as they gave us receivers and, uh, some DBs and a linebacker thrown in there. I, you know, Jerry, if you're watching, you know, thank you for giving us the names we got, but there's not a lot of continuity of what we got today. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll be uh, back inside for the practice, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, we're supposed to be in there for the full practice Can have another practice viewing uh, opportunity another week or so after that. And then of course the spring game on Saturday, April 13th should be plenty more to watch, plenty more to learn. As we've said over the years, it, what's most telling when we get to watch is what has changed from week one to week two to week three to week four to week five of spring ball. There's always changes that we always learn a lot from those, learn a lot from talking to the players and the coaches as well. We're starting to get a sense that Jeremiah Smith might be pretty good at this football thing. Carnell Tate to Caleb Downs, whole bunch of whole bunch of players for Ohio State fans to be excited about. Did a whole show about the offensive line on the morning show. Uh, yesterday, which if that was a, a position of concern for you last year, 
I mean, go back and listen to the morning show that uh, dropped on Wednesday evening, and you tell me if that is the most happy, relaxed Ryan Day you have heard in a long time, because it sure seemed like it to me. It was uh, Ryan Day feels like a guy who knows he's got a pretty good football team. So we will continue covering that football team, no matter how good they are. We'll be covering them all spring, all summer, and all fall at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Kevin, Tony, and I there covering the team, covering practices, interviews, all that fun stuff. We'll be at all the games, all this stuff you know, you know and love from us. Plus, Mark covering recruiting, some potentially very big news coming there as well in the next week or so as the Buckeyes have at least one and possibly more t- uh, top targets announcing their decisions before the end of the month. Mark covering that recruiting for you. And of course, our whole team of X's and O's gurus, Ross and the rest of the guys, all making you a smarter football fan. Plus, the huddle board presented by Jeff Ruby Steakhouse, where we, we talk to you, answer your questions, much, much more, all at BuckeyeHuddle.com. We hope to see you there. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.